us who want to see the world change can spend a lot of time talking to apparently interested people who then say, yeah, we really need to do something about this, but the fundamental structures, fundamental infrastructure that underpins capitalist economies hasn't changed as a result of that dialogue. So transition started from an assumption that actually in order to make change happen, I'm sorry, I'll talk as loudly as I can, it's pretty much, do come right to the front as well, if, 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 sorry. Unless, Mike, can you stop the wind? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but you're such a powerful person. I'm hoping the marquee takes it, won't So, so, so if if we if we see a, a, a way of running society which is, is based on a resource which is not going to be available forever, and also the use of that resource is pretty much destroying our ability to 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 live. What do we do if we assume that those with power are not going to change things? We can seek insurrection, revolution. We can seek to build institutions within what's there. Or we can seek to build in our own communities something that shows another way of being is possible. And not only that another way of being is possible, it's actually really attractive, it's really inviting. And that's really where transition started from. So, Starting from that analysis of climate change and peak oil and from a fundamental assumption that what we need to do is do practical things in communities. And we need to do that in a way that invites everyone to join us. So, you know, Transition actually, the, the people who run Transition Houston are ex-employees of Shell. They've come from big oil. They actually really understand peak oil fantastically. They've spent their lives working out how do you get this? Uh, how could I know? And, 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 and they really understand what's going on around resource scarcity. You know, in a lar large parts of the southern US, to even mention climate change is going to put you in a place where no one's going to listen to. But if you talk about resource scarcity in that society, then you can often really chime with what people think about and, and what they believe. And, and, and right from the start, we decided in setting up transition as a bottom-up decentralized movement that while there had to be core principles so it retained some coherence but actually it would be down to people in their local communities to work out what really worked what chimed what they wanted to focus on you know it's not for us to mandate to kind of say this is how you have to do it although there is a tension around that so what actually happened in the early days was when we set up transition network there were three transition communities and we thought, well, maybe in a few years there'll be kind of five, six, seven, eight, maybe all in the southwest of England because that's where it started. And then just really from week one, it kind of exploded and it was happening everywhere. And we were forever being asked questions and having to deal with them on the hoof. So I remember three or four months in getting a call from someone in Kern saying, I really want to get a transition initiative going. There's another person uh, in Krukern who's massively active, totally gets climate change, totally gets uh, resource scarcity, peak oil, is already planting loads of fruit trees, lo 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 loads of nut trees. He's a member of the BMP. And actually, that's really interesting, because some, sometimes because there are some elements of the way some people portray transition that can be attractive to effectively right-wing isolationists who say, I want to be completely self-sufficient. I don't want anything to do with those people who may have different beliefs, different colours. I want my community of all the people like me to kind of be able to exist in a kind of autarkic little sphere. And so we kind of had to sit and think, well, what do we do about that? You know, if this is a decentralised bottom-up movement, can we say, no, you can't be a member of the BNP? Well, we think we decided actually we can say no. You can't be a member of the BNP, and we said if you want to be involved in setting up a transition initiative and you want to work with Transition Network, that's your choice. But then you have to accept the principles of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and that's not negotiable. So there's this constant dance between a decentralised bottom-up movement and that attempt to have coherence, and that was one of the kind of bits of the dance where we flipped over into saying no actually there are some things that are completely non-negotiable and that is one of them. So what happened then was that transition kind of spread not, not just 
quickly across communities in, in, in the UK, started spreading in other countries too. And then we got faced with a whole series of other questions immediately, which was, well, what does it mean to say that we as Transition Network are supporting this movement of communities with a suggestions as to a process, suggestions as to way, ways to deal with the issues that you then face if you're trying to do a meaningful community process. Uh, and now there are people wanting to do it in uh, three countries, oh God, it's six countries, oh God, it's nine countries. How do we support them? And, and also, what does it mean that a bunch of basically white middle class people in England are talking to people across the world from massively different circumstances about how they do this. You know, what do we do about the power that is implicit in being the prime movers? How do we hold that in a way that actually continues to support this movement and is responsible while acknowledging that power of any sort can have amazingly negative consequences? So I suppose the principles that we sought to apply in that, and we're still thinking about this, it's an ongoing discussion, is that actually power can be incredibly useful as long as it's always accountable and transparent. So the question is, how do we make it accountable and transparent? How do we enable people who feel that they want to engage in dialogue to engage in that dialogue in a meaningful way? And again, that's something I'd be really happy and interested to discuss with you all. So what, where is it now? What's, what does transition look like now? Uh, it's happening in about 44 countries in very different ways. The way it happens in countries that are suffering from massive economic stress, such as uh, Portugal or Greece, looks incredibly different to the way it functions here in the UK at the moment. In Portugal in particular, they have focused almost entirely on how do you do transition without ever asking people to contribute money because there's an assumption that actually people really don't have money. So they've run whole events. Most of what they run is, is run on a gift economy basis. It's what can we bring to this in a way that doesn't kind of filter through having money or not. Uh, in, in the US, transition looks incredibly different in different places. You know, in, in, in some parts of the US, as I said, they basically don't really talk about climate change at all. They may well believe that it's, it's incredibly important, but they, they know that actually, for a lot of those audiences, that's just not going to work. Um, we've, got, we've got transition taking place in Iran at the moment. Uh, and, and I don't even, I can't even begin to think what that's going to be like, how that's going to be different. But I do have a really clear memory at, a, I think, the third transition conference of talking to a bunch of women from Brazil who were saying, how should we do transition in Brazil? And me just saying, well, why are you asking me? You know, how, are you, how are you guys doing transition in Brazil? What does it look like? And one of the early experiences from transition in Brazil was that applying the training that we had developed here in a pretty much literate country, not an entirely literate country, just didn't work there because they were doing transition training in the favelas of Sao Paulo and other places where actually the assumption was that people wouldn't be li literate. So they had to completely rejig the training. And that's also really interesting, isn't it? If you think about transition and where it came from initially, it came from, this is to generalise obviously, it came from societies that tend to have too much, too much money, money too much energy, massively badly distributed, but too much, and, 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 and are really struggling in terms of solidarity, in terms of community processes a lot of the time. And yet there it was happening in the favelas of Sao Paulo where it's the exact opposite. You know, they certainly don't have too much of a lot of things, and they certainly do have massively more solidarity. But the basic process of saying that we will trust in the communal genius of community, but we will offer a process where you start to address these issues and start to ask these questions, seems to have worked there. So what we've got at the moment is transition, as I said, happening in loads of countries. In lots of those countries, there are what we call national hubs. So there's actually a kind of version of what Transition Network does operating at a country level saying uh, how do we support transition in this particular country or region or place. And now we're trying to work out, well, how do we take account of that? So as of probably two months' time, we will have on our board of trustees probably two, certainly one, representative of these national hubs. So we start to make ourselves a meaningful account to, to, to a worldwide movement. And again, that is something that we're having to learn as we're going along. Because, you know, if I, if I go back to what I said initially, when, when we first set up seven years ago, 
we expected this to be a kind of a small thing that would maybe start to take root in the southwest of England. And really, kind of pretty much from day one, it's just kind of gone the way it wants to go. So that was it, really, on transition. I know that's kind of very general and broad brush, and I'm kind of, as I said, really happy to discuss a bit more. I wanted to turn <coughs> briefly to kind of transition and anarchism before we open up more. I'll start by saying that uh, I would describe myself as an anarchist, but I would certainly not describe transition as a movement as an anarchist movement. It is very explicitly not party politically aligned. That is not to say that implicit in having a community-based response to resource scarcity, climate change and economic volatility, there aren't very clear principles. And one of the clear principles is what does a community-based response to resource scarcity actually imply and look like? And I think that has to imply some, some critique of and moving away from the, the very concept of individual ownership. Because actually if we're serious about having limited resources that we're then going to use in a more egalitarian way, then what, what does the concept of individual ownership bring to that? The concept of communal ownership of resources, and I think there's, a real, there's an interesting question about is the community simply one at the present or are we thinking about future communities? And another interesting for me question, are we thinking about human communities only or are we thinking more broadly than that? But core in a community response to these sorts of crises for me is a, uh, a questioning of, a critique of the concept of individual ownership. Now if you went out and asked people active in transition whether they would agree with that or not, I think you'd find an enormous diversity of response. Actually, I think you would find some people who uh, would be kind of quite horrified at that. And then you'd find a lot of other people for whom that would really chime. But then also, what does that mean practically in our current kind of Western, particularly, say, let's say in the UK, you know, here, here we are in a fairly neoliberal society with the kind of last vestiges of the, of the welfare state being dismantled around us. What does it mean to say that we are trying to build a movement that actually is about communal ownership of things? So let's take uh, Bath and West Community Energy. Based in Bath, down the road, come out, came out of Transition Bath, it's saying, OK, we're going to have a community, communally owned renewable uh, energy supplier. But they, they had a share issue, and actually, to, to buy shares in that, you have to have some money. So it's not fully accept uh, accessible to everyone. But they actually have uh, committed to using some of their profits to have a, a community fund which starts to make it more accessible. So, you know, they, like all of us, are trying to do what they can in a society where the infrastructures, the status quos, push you very hard in one direction. Is that enough? I don't know, but they're doing something. And I think that's really core to what, what, what transition is about, is the idea that we get up and do something now, and that we actually really, really focus on that doing as well, because by doing, we start to give people hope. And we start to give people a way of engaging beyond simply feeling outraged or angry or despairing. You know, uh, 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 having, having uh, been involved more with kind of anarchist movements a long time ago, you know, my, I, I still remember the emotional feeling of kind of anger and at sometimes that tipping over into despair. And I think one of the things that has most given me energy and passion and enjoyment in transition is that really deliberate focus that we have on doing things that, that enable people to feel that change is possible. Whether or not that change is going to achieve what we want to see in the world, none of us have the faintest. But it does start to give you energy. And I think it was Edward Said who said, uh, you know, political activism is impossible without optimism. And that's true, but actually you can turn it on its head. I think unless you actively are doing something, then if you share what I assume most of us would uh, share as an analysis of what's going on in the world, then unless you're doing something, optimism is pretty impossible too. So, you know, the, the activism and the optimism in transition kind of come together. So what, what are the elements that I would see, take from anarchism and say I can clearly see in, in transition? Well, one of the elements is very clearly that 
if there is going to be authority, if there's going to be power, then we have to have it as transparent and accountable. And it's an acceptance too of the psychological processes that in any group of people, however we define the structures, there will be power, there will be hierarchy. So are we going to be open about that? Are we then going to enable questioning of it? Are we going to pretend it's not there? I think also from anarchism, the idea that uh, uh, whatever power there is, uh, we always have to question and minimise. I, 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 I hope we see that in transition. We certainly attempt to model that in transition network. Uh, but again, it's a work in progress and we certainly do make mistakes. I think, again, it depends slightly how you define anarchism, because I've had discussions on anarchism with, particularly from the states, right-wing libertarians, and they're describing an entirely different worldview and uh, assessment than me. So, but assuming the kind of uh, more left anarchism that I, I, I've grown up with and been familiar with, I think that how do we base everything in, in community and how do we build from that that is really, really core to transition. So there are some kind of broad brush themes of things that I would draw out as analogies and parallels. Over to you guys. Hmm. Uh, do you ask questions? Or comments, it doesn't comments. have to be a question. I think you'll have to really speak up. Um, you touched on earlier about um, how the model of transition is kind of flexible and adaptive. The world, like the ways that they see the environment and relate to the environment. Could you develop that? Um, well, we started out with a very clear and simple process, a 12 step process. Uh, and what we found was that in some, in, in some cultures, people applied that process in exactly the order of the steps we suggested, and they found that it worked well. But in other cultures, some, some things just weren't as necessary, didn't work in the same way. So one of the bits of that initial 12 steps, or one of the principles was called honouring the elders. And it was talking to people about how their lives were before we had this enormous amount of fossil fuel flowing through everything. So, you know, if you talk to people who are out, kind of growing up or active before the Second World War in this country, then they certainly have a memory of a life where their carbon footprint was kind of very, very significantly lower than ours. Actually, in Japan, where transition has taken off really well, that honouring the elders is just bound, bound in and implicit to the way they live their lives in a totally different way than here. So that's a kind of an example of how things can look very different, because what they found in Japan was you didn't actually have to have that as an explicit step part of your process at all. And then you also get, it's not just about cultural differences, it's about actually the reality on the ground. Staying with Japan, transition was kind of reasonably healthy and until the tsunami and uh, the nuclear catastrophe or kind of depending on how you define catastrophe. Post then it's just gone berserk. Uh, people who particularly were doing, doing activity around uh, solar energy uh, have been enormously in demand and it's kind of spreading everywhere. So, so as well as the cultural difference you'll get very specific differences. You know, when I hear that transition is actually taking off in some rural parts of India where they're really, really focused on food growing, then I have no conception, to be honest, of how that's going to be different because I have no understanding of what it means to actually get up every day and actually have to grow my food in order not to starve. You know, that is a million miles from my, my understanding of the world. But I know apparently the process is working well there. I know it's going to be different. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, one is that obviously when transition started, it was about climate change and peak oil. And actually, what we've seen is something rather different than we imagined. You know, we, we're now into the age of extreme energy, and we've got fracking and mountaintop removal and tar sands and all the rest of it. So actually, for a lot of people, you know, who aren't transitioners, it might seem that we don't actually have resource scarcity at all. Mm. So I wondered, could you maybe kind of enlarge on that and whether transition yeah. has actually changed its, its kind of approach a bit in the age of extreme energy? Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think analyses tend to get simplified enormously. And, and actually, 
the analysis around peak oil uh, from say seven years ago was that because industrial society is addicted to and dependent on easily accessible kind of dense energy like, like you get from oil, we would in that desperation do almost anything to get it. And if extreme energy is all about that, it's about that desperation. So that was actually, peak oil has never been about saying we're going to run out of it. It's been about saying it's going to get more expensive overall and with volatility in price and it's going to get harder uh, for, for particularly for people who have less money and that's whole societies or individuals or communities to access now all of that has actually actually really happened you know when we were talking about peak oil seven years ago the price of oil was like 30 40 50 dollars a barrel it's now steady at 100 plus ish with a little bit of variation that's already peak oil for a lot of poor, poor societies, countries, because they can't afford it anymore. Um, so I don't think the analysis has changed. I, I, whether or not the activities have changed will vary down to individual communities. Certainly, for example, Transition Cowbridge in South Wales said, well, it's all very well saying we're, we're for things and so we don't get involved in activism against. We do not want fracking on our doorstep. We don't want a potential risk to our water for the next 10,000 years or earthquakes or that and so as transition power bridge we're going to get involved in opposing the exploratory drilling and they did and they succeeded in making it su su sufficiently difficult for the, the drilling company to go on so so I suppose there's that there's that change where sometimes what you're faced with as a as a transition initiative is so extreme that you say well it's very well uh, being positive, but one of the things I, I I like about how that change has happened is that you know I was talking to Ten Ten uh, a while ago about what they might do around fracking and around doing something positive, and I kind of talked to them about this idea that they've now come up with the Balcom of saying, well, actually, what we do if we've got a community that wants to oppose fracking is we go in and we say, how do we supply you with sufficient renewables so that there's no kind of possibility of accusing you of being NIMBYs and I think that that is actually the way that transition is going it's saying okay if we're going to resist these things which actually support us all in this room you know I mean, you know we all of us are living off that energy then how, how do we do that positive as part of the rejection mm. and, and sorry just going on a little bit more it was, it was very simplistic in the early days, that, that uh, climate change and peak oil. And, and massively important now is the whole economic volatility part of it. So the analysis of what is or isn't possible in, uh, in a kind of globalised neoliberal system has become more and more important to some people. And in Bristol, you know, the Bristol Pound actually comes out of a process that Transition Network supported of saying, what are the on-the-ground reactions to this? Now, I think looking at the Bristol Pound is a really interesting example of how do we do something meaningful in a global economy? Because is the Bristol Pound actually really making a difference to those in Bristol who actually can't access things because they're too poor? Not much. I mean, it's great that it's allied to the credit union and it has potential to make that sort of difference, but is it at the moment making that difference? I don't think so. Is there potential in it? Yes. Therefore, is it worth doing? Well, I think it's worth doing, but that's a, that's an ongoing experiment and question. My question is about land. Um, in order to have a transition that's going to be feeding everybody when we're not going to be able to have food coming from far away, how does the transition process Negotiate getting land for that to happen, and what tactics is it, is it doing at the moment? What do you think it will do? Um, again, it, it varies massively from country to country. You know, there are there are some cultures, societies where um, land is much much more available, and then somewhere it's even less available than here. And for example, if you were to look at a, a really crowded city-state like Singapore I can't really start to imagine what transition would look like in Singapore because you know it's but the, the the process so far 
that, that I've seen kind of practically on the ground, there's been obviously community supported ag agriculture schemes where people have come together to sometimes buy farms and run them, sometimes work with farmers. Uh, there's been some exploration of kind of closed loop uh, aquaculture and lettuce, etc., high street shops. And I've seen some really good plans for that, but not a lot actually happening on the ground yet. There's been obviously community orchards, communal allotments, things like that. I don't think there's been a kind of overall strategic what could we do. We, certainly in the early days we were behind the analysis can Britain feed itself. So it was saying how much land is there in the UK, what's the population, could we actually feed ourselves if we were seeking to be, to grow pretty much all our food in the UK. And the answer was depending on what we choose to eat, we certainly can. Assuming a kind of stable climate, uh, uh, roughly like what we've got now, because you know, God knows. Um, how would we then access that land? I mean, I, I, I would say at some point, as things intensify, we're going to get into really significant battles over land, where we're gonna, uh, uh, there's gonna have to be some communal taking of land that is owned and unused. Are we at that stage yet? Is there a sufficient other kind of communal understanding of that and demand for that? Absolutely not. You know, I don't see it looking around me or looking at the debates going on. But, you know, I, I would anticipate that as that gets sharper, then transition initiatives will vary in, in the degree to which they get involved in that kind of movement. So, it needs to be playing the fields, which is already yes. starting to look at that. Yeah, I mean, the, no, the, there are the seeds of that kind of analysis. But tra transition, what transition does is it, it poses a series of questions about the way the world is set up and what's going on. And it says to people, what, it, what, what can we do about this? But what can we do about it in a way that invites people in? Now, you need a lot of people asking questions about how land ownership functions before you get lots of communities doing something about it. So, you know, the, the, the question then becomes, is there sufficient debate? Are people asking the question? And actually, what, what quite often happens is it takes a shock to jolt people into asking those questions in a different way. And the financial shock of 2008 has, I think, completely changed the way a lot of people talk about economics and money. And it was interesting, uh, David Graeber, uh, who has written about debt and money a lot, he has a thesis that actually revolutions take 20 to 30 years to feed through, the important revolutions, the revolutions in social consciousness. So he points back to all the ferment of change in 1968, he said, when you look at institutions changing, like having gay marriage now, that goes back to a lot of the ideas of 1968, and it can take a long time. Now, I can completely see that as an analysis. My worry about that is that from a climate change perspective, I don't feel like we've got 30 or 40 years. I don't know how long we've got, and in a way it doesn't matter. The point is to do as much as we can now. But that tension around urgency is a really tricky one, you know. Uh, and, and it certainly doesn't feel like we can go on putting out carbon into the atmosphere, well not just carbon, all the greenhouse gases, for 30 years. So I don't know. Can you talk about the relationship between sort of anarchist tendencies and sort of predecessor groups of transition? And then you also mentioned a bit about uh, who has power in the transition movement. I mean, who are the, maybe the, the key person with power in the transition movement at the moment? And how is he held accountable or her? I don't know who it is. All right. Um, I, I don't think I can say anything sensible or meaningful about the relationship between transition and kind of predecessor groups uh, because it just varies so much. You know, I mean, certainly some of the people who get involved in transition come from an anarchist sensibility or have been involved in activism. And maybe Transition Heathrow is one of the best examples of that. So that was mainly climate change activists, a lot of whom would call themselves anarchists, uh, saying, oh. sorry? Oh. Grow Heathrow. It initially was called Transition Heathrow, yeah. uh, saying, okay, we, we want to do something to stop the runway, but we want to embed it in the local community that also doesn't want the runway. So they squatted a disused market garden and they started running loads and loads of courses and events but with the local people and they lived there and and it was kind of 
it was rooted activism rather than people kind of saying, well, I'm going to go there and I'm going to move on to somewhere else. Because some of the kind of oppositional activity that happens in the UK is not necessarily local people. It's people who say, well, I don't want it to be mountaintop removal, strip mining in South Wales, so we're going to go there for a couple of months. But Transition or Grow Heathrow has taken a very deliberate, we want to be here for the long term. And I think that's a really interesting example of the kind of the, the, the currents coming together. Uh, in terms of accountability and power, um, Transition Network has no power to say to any initiative, you must do this or you mustn't do that. It does have the power to set ground rules, like the ground rule I talked about, about saying you have to sign up to the UN Declaration of Human Rights if you're going to be involved in the core group helping an initiative. You know, so there's a kind of a setting of boundaries. But yeah, we, we have a lot of what I'm talking about, that kind of undefined power in Transition Network, you know, where, where actually when we say things and do things, it has a massive impact on what a lot of people say and do. And we get asked a lot of questions like what should we do in this sort of sense, which we usually try to say, we don't know, you probably know better, but we involve in ourselves in a discussion. Who has power in Transition Network? Um, Rob Hopkins, uh, as a kind of the most visible spokesperson, has a degree of power, uh, but, you know, we, we make sure that what Rob is talking about is being discussed by the people who work in Transition Network, so there's a kind of communal accountability within it. Um, we have someone who plays a, a role, the title is Delivery Director, which means that actually they're responsible for making sure that all of the things that we've said we'll deliver to, say, funders, uh, are being delivered, and they're responsible for checking that we're doing what. We, we have a, a group process for agreeing our strategy and our work plan, and then that person is responsible for making sure that everyone is actually complying with what we've done as a group, so there's power there. And I suppose the person who has the, the most unaccountable power, in a way, is me, as Chair of Trustees, because uh, it is set up and registered as a charity, therefore, at the end of the day, the board has responsibility for the strategy, and the Chair of the Board arguably has the most power. So that's the answer to your question. <laughs> I just add that the uh, grow heat drive um, happened because of the gateway that the climate camp movement was started at heat drive. Right. So it was through um, uh, a multiplicit thing that happened. It was both protest, act, action, yeah. activism, education around those issues. Yeah. And it developed a really strong relationship with the community first. Right. And then the grow heat drive happened in France. I think, you know, I mean, it depends, depends on what kind of anarchist you are as well, because there are anarchists who would say you should never engage with institutions of state in any way. Uh, and transition certainly doesn't say that. I mean, we're incredibly wary of the institutions of state, but a core part of any transition initiative usually is to try and work with their local council on the very pragmatic basis that their local council actually can do a lot of meaningful things not just in, in the way it impacts on people's lives, but actually in what's going on environmentally, a whole range of things. And another kind of really minor example, um, the transition groups just over the Severn Bridge around Chepstone in, in the Monmouth area, they've been working with their local council now for a long time. And one of the things that the they've convinced the local council to do is to completely change their planting policy so that their planting policy is informed by what supports pollinators, mainly bees. Now that might sound like a small thing, I don't think it's a small thing actually, I think that's a really, really important thing. And if by doing that they've made a significant change, that's fantastic. We need loads of those kinds of changes, you know. Do you have sitting in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Peter? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we know each other from yeah. before yeah. and that thing. Yeah. So we've, we've, so I'm a town councillor in Froome not far from here, and, we've, and it's really interesting you say that because we've, we took over the council in order to do things like that because we got the, 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 the ability to 
get the council to do what we wanted was zero. So we sort of went for a, a slightly different approach as, so you're as transition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. So, I mean, yeah. we need a. You, you talked about a multiplicity of different things coming together. I think we need a multiplicity of approaches too. You know, because because not only do local circumstances vary, but we don't know what works. We, I don't, there's no historical precedent for having a ticking clock in the way that we have one now. You know, change has always been urgently required, whether you're talking about from a social justice perspective or or whatever. But, we, for the first time as a species, we're faced with this ability to fundamentally transform the world we're trying to operate in in a negative way. And so, you know, I would love to see loads of different approaches. And one of the things I really hoped for when we were setting up Transition Network was that there would be a kind of ecosystem of different reactions to the situation we find ourselves in. And that we'd be able to learn from what other movements were doing and they'd be able to learn from us. Yeah. And that happens to some degree, but actually I've been continually surprised by, certainly in the industrialized West, the fact that there aren't way more movements and, and people questioning, and, 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 and that probably is a, a reflection of the kind of, the power of, of the system that we're in, in terms of the way it affects the way we think, as opposed to necessarily money flows or what we do, you know, the, the, the kind of, the, the, dampening down of our ability to question and really look at what's going on around us is incredibly powerful, which is why we start from a principle of how do we enable people to ask questions. So one of the things that we've been thinking about recently is, okay, we've kind of stepped right back from processes like the COP, the climate change negotiation process, but is that right? Should we be doing that? And we've got COP coming up in Paris. Uh, in, you know, in a couple of years' time, a bit under a couple of years, are we going to do something in the lead up to that? And we talked about that quite a lot. And then, Rob, as a result of that, Rob put a, a blog saying, "Well, look, can we do something meaningful, which would not be about doing this kind of negotiation dance where everyone says, God, climate change is terrible, and no one actually does anything? It would be about getting every single transition initiative that wants to take part to say, at some point, shortly before the COP." We're going to go to our local parliamentarian and we're going to show them what we're actually doing and then we're going to kind of somehow pull all of that together to show the kind of very, very timid beasts that are politicians that there is actually a global movement that wants to do something about this and to give them that reinforcement in the lead up to those negotiations. So that's an idea. I don't know if it will work. That's us again making it up as we go along. But that's what we're thinking at the moment might be a useful thing to do, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is that, uh, the first question is about the, how useful the term transition is, considering how different initiatives around the world are. So it be, this will lead to a second question. The second question is about the, how politically reflexive the transition movement is, which feeds into the first question, like, is it analytically the term are useful if transitions are so different? So with the second question, what I'm trying to get to is that I find the transition movement very successful in drawing people together, in bringing people together to do things. And that's very interesting because it really addresses one of the key issues uh, that we face with neoliberal capitalism, which is alienation. So by bringing people together, people do things, people talk, and you start, you know, like breaking with this alienation. So the question about politically reflexivity is because I have worked with transition, uh, transition initiative in London for maybe a year and a half. And in this initiative specifically, people um, openly say that um, they don't want to talk politics openly. So they are there to do things, to go out and uh, grow some food or try to set up an uh, energy co-op. Mm -hmm. But to be inclusive, one of the things you highlighted in your talk, um, to talk politics is not something that should be done in that uh, scenario. 
okay? Maybe they do talk politics outside. Mm -hmm. Everything transition do is political anyway. But if we don't talk politics, how do we know where we go? Okay. Right? So in the, for example, in the, one of the key concepts the transition uh, movement uses is the, the, the idea of resilience. Right? If we don't ask why we're building resilience for, or who are we building resilience for, then are we not missing an opportunity by having these people coming together and doing things? Are we not missing the chance to actually build social relationships that are based on political activity? Okay. So do this. Tom, did you want to comment or before I answer? No, no, okay. um, I, I don't know whether the, the, the word transition is uh, overall more positive than negative, whether it's a kind of an appropriate framing word. Um, any word, any, the, the, the point about words is not what they mean in, in, in principle. The point about words is how are they used, not what do they um, signify to people. And, and quite often words get changed very quickly if they appear to signify something that threatens those with power. So, you know, the, 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 the word sustainable, for example, at one point had, I think, maybe 20 years ago, a much clearer meaning than it has now. But then, once you start to get a lot of multinationals talking about sustainable this and sustainable that, it changes its meaning. So, is there, is, is transition, which already was a word which had a variety of meanings, a kind of the best, clearest word? Probably not. Is, is, is there a way that we're going to actually now change it, given that the movement's been going seven years and is all over the world? Almost certainly not. Uh, but, you know, happy to, to get suggestions or comments or thoughts on that. Political reflexivity and discussion. I think that the, the underlying principle is that we are inviting people to ask questions of what they see in the world around them. And that might, in the situation they're in, that might be a question about the, the, the cost of their electricity or their worry about the kind of food that their children are being given to eat at school or almost anything. You know. Now those questions can lead to very overtly political discussions in some places and in other places they don't. Some people feel comfortable with discussing politics and other people don't. I, I know a lot of people in transition who do talk explicitly and politically more and more since 2007 8 uh, about the way that multinational capitalism works, the way that the financial flows impact on what everyone does, and the space that leaves for people to lead a kind of autonomous and meaningful life. I know a lot of people who would hate to have those conversations. One of the things I would like to see is a way of enabling people in transition initiatives to feel more politically and economically literate. People usually feel able to talk about climate change. It's a kind of a physical thing that you can describe even if you get into a d debate and discussion about it. Similarly around resource scarcity, it's a kind of pretty straightforward idea that there's a limited amount of something and if more and more of us are using more and more of it, at some point we're going to have to change. When it comes to talking about economics, most pe a lot of people in transition initiatives go, oh my god, I just don't know where to start, I don't know how to frame it, I, you know, and so one of the things that I've been uh, trying to get some funding for is to do what I call a kind of economics mapping, uh, 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 kind of having a wiki site where you could say, okay, what are the core defining attributes of what we've mainly got in the world now, neoliberal capitalism, what are the core differing critiques, such as the feminist economic critique, the steady state critique, the Marxist ecological critique, you know, I, I could name about 10 different critiques. Where do we find out more about those? Where do we have discussions about those? Where can we get basic tools? Because I want people to feel able to have, ask these questions, have those discussions. We can't have discussions about economics without starting to move into discussions about politics. I think one of the reasons that people say, oh my God, I'm not going to talk about that, it might be because they don't want to alienate people with different views. I think usually it's because they don't feel confident to do it not on a kind of, this is what, because they get, you, get, you get asked really hard questions, you know. Uh, so I really like the way, in transition, we frame things as enabling uh, us to ask ourselves and others questions, rather than providing a, this is the answer. 
perspectives. I don't think we've done enough to enable the asking of the economic questions which shade into political. And actually we've got a bit of funding, finally, uh, to, to start to do that work, which is great. Does that answer your question or your comment? <laughs> It's tough. <laughs> We've got five minutes left. Uh, Tom, you had a question. Um, it's an announcement or an invitation for anybody who's got an interest in contributing to imagining and shaping the future of transition in Bristol um, to an event that's going to be here, well, inside on the 25th of May, uh, Sunday morning. Uh, four weeks from tomorrow in the morning we'll have an event where we'll look at what's happened in Bristol in and around transition where we are now and take a look at what we might do in the future particularly in the context of various top-down activities that appropriate some of the language of transition as green capital versus Bristol apparently a resilient city now so what do we as grass movements grassroots movements in the city how do we want to engage with them if at all and if we don't just to come together remind ourselves we're all out there connect and do some uh, do some planning and then the weather will be glorious even better than today at lunchtime we'll go outside and into the garden have a good time so please come along I don't have any flyers with me but if you look at the Transition Bristol website, transitionbristol.net, you'll find the link to the Eventbrite page if you want to register or just turn up on the page. Please do good. I'm wondering, I don't know if you may have, so came in late, you may have already addressed it, but have you got any plans for the transition Well, we, we the, there was an interesting thing that happened, oh God, four or five months ago probably, uh, where the BBC picked up that someone from a, a transition initiative was saying that they thought fracking overall was probably the least worst. And of course they ran this as, as a kind of, as a story. So what we did was we uh, got a whole load of views on fracking, including from the guy who'd said that, and we ran it, it got lots of discussion and debate. I mean, I, I would, certainly in Transition Network, uh, there's not a single person who thinks that fracking is a good idea, and we're all deeply opposed to it. Uh, as a movement, you know, I would expect over 99% of people to be opposed to fracking, but, Again, uh, I think you probably missed when I talked about Transition Cowbridge, where you know it's it, it's down to communities then what they do about that. And I and, and I mentioned the, the way Ten Ten have supported Balcom to, to do okay to do uh, renewables at the same time as opposing fracking, because I think that's a much more powerful statement to people. Because if you simply say to people, we can't you have or use that energy. Most people will think that my whole life depends on being able to flick the switch. So we've got to say, this is how you can live your life despite not having that energy in some way. Now, I would hope that we will get much more explicit about the need for our lives to fundamentally change as well as having renewables. Because renewable, you know, to me the discussion should be, are renewables a sufficient bridge to the lives we're going to lead, rather than is fracking a sufficient bridge? But I have really significant questions about what role renewables really could play. You know, just partly in terms of the, the rare the rare earth minerals and other things that are involved in, in, in making renewables happening, all of the fossil fuels that actually underpin the production of renewables, etc. etc. I don't think we can go on living the lives lives we need at the moment. But I, I don't see a mass movement uh, saying we don't want to lead these lives. And, and there, there was a kind of uh, a statement, you know, I've never seen anyone riot for austerity. And I'm not seeing a massive movement saying we need to lead much energy poorer life. We do need to lead lives with much less surplus net energy in them. But how we get a movement which embraces that, asks that question, does that, is not necessarily by standing up and saying, guys, we've got it all wrong, we've got to do it completely differently. So, so but yeah, I mean, opposed to fracking is the much simpler, shorter answer to your question.